been six months now, so we should be used to it, but it's still hard to believe that, you know, we're still doing virtual church instead of meeting in person. Uh, of course, I miss all you guys. Our family misses all you guys. I'm sure you miss us. Uh, hopefully soon we can meet together again in person. But until then, we will be thankful to God for what we have. As far as I know, nobody's gotten sick or uh, I'm not even sure if many people have lost their jobs in our community, but uh, things have been good comparatively. So um, we're going to always be thankful to God for every breath in our lives and everything that he has given to us. And that's kind of the theme of what I wanted to talk to about, uh, talk to you today about. Uh, we're going to actually read from Psalms 140. I guess I'll go ahead and read that to you before we start. Psalms 140. Deliver me, O Lord, from the evil man. Preserve me from the violent man, which imagine mischiefs in their heart. Continually are they gathered together for war. They have sharpened their tongues like a serpent. Adder's poison is under their lips. Keep me, O Lord, from the hands of the wicked. Preserve me from the violent men who have purposed to overthrow my goings. The proud have hid a snare for me in cords. They have spread a net by the wayside. They have set gins for me. I said unto the Lord, Thou art my God. Hear the voice of my supplications, O Lord. O God, the Lord, the strength of my salvation. Thou hast covered my head in the day of battle. Grant not, O Lord, the desires of the wicked. Further not his wicked device, lest they exalt themselves. As for, head of, as for the head of those that compass me about, let the mischief of their own lips cover them. Let burning coals fall upon them. Let them be cast into the fire in a deep pits, that they rise not up again. Let not an evil speaker be established in the earth. Evil shall hunt the violent man to overthrow. I know that the Lord will maintain the cause of the afflicted and the right of the poor. Surely the righteousness shall give thanks unto thy name. The upright shall dwell in thy presence. So for those of you who are young, I'm talking about mainly high schoolers, young adults, uh, college students. This is not for the young little kids because I don't want to explode your little minds and your little world because you still watch Disney movies and everything so I don't want to mess up your mindset but for those of you who are younger young adults um, those of us who are older we have a little secret that we want to let you in on right you know what I'm talking about all you older guys and women the world is not really a nice place full of nice people I know you know especially if you are raised in Western culture we watched Disney movies growing up where the good guy always wins and the underdog always beats the bad guy. And the bad guy is like a singular villain who exists in some faraway galaxy and everybody bands up together to beat him or her and good wins out. Now, of course, in the end, we believe that God will win out. But in between, you know, the world is not always a good place full of nice people. Even people that you think are good people a lot of them are not nice to you. A lot of your own neighbors even secretly probably don't like you. I hate to break it to you, but even some of your own family members don't like you. And they're so, somewhat jealous of you. As you get older, you'll understand what that's all about. Especially Malayalis. I don't know about other Indian groups, but I know Malayalis, they're really jealous of each other. Even family members, okay? You'll know what we're talking about when you get older. You'll hear the conversations. You'll see the actions. And you'll see that, like... Nobody wants to know that somebody else's kids are doing better than their kids and et cetera, et cetera. I know we're not supposed to talk about that stuff, but it exists, so we'll just kind of like keep it under the rug. But just for those of you who are younger, just realize that, you know, not everyone in the world wants the best for you. So, you know, if you're like David, um, which means you're not perfect because we know David's many flaws, and he, by the way, wrote this psalm, um, you are seeking after God and his will for your life, okay? And so some of the proclamations that David makes in this chapter, you can kind of apply in your own life and have an understanding of the way the world works around you and how you should react to the world and who you should call upon and how you should give thanks to God for what he is going to deliver you from. Now, if you read verses 1 through 2, notice the words violence. 
Deliver me, O Lord, from the evil man. Preserve me from the violent man, which imagine mischiefs in their heart. Continually are they gathered together for war. So there's like an emphasis on these words like violent and mischief and war. And so what you have to understand is, you know, he's talking metaphorically. It doesn't have to be, you know, actual physical violence and war and physical mischief. It can also be emotional, psychological, spiritual violence and war. And that's what you have to realize that when we're living our lives in this world out there, the, the enemies are not always physically attacking us, but they're emotional, emotionally, psychologically, and spiritually attacking you. And David here is talking about both the physical and the spiritual realms, because a lot of these are basically metaphors for things that are happening in the spiritual and emotional world. So there, uh, when people are attacking you, you can read in verses 3 and 4. Those enemies that are David's, they have sharpened their tongues like a serpent. An adder's poison is under their lips. Keep me, O Lord, from the hands of the wicked. Preserve me from the violent men who have purpose to overthrow my guns. So you have to understand that if we're not just dealing with the physical realm, we're also dealing with the spiritual and emotional realm. People are not always using physical weapons like swords and arrows and guns or machine guns like in our day. They're using their tongues. And how do they use your, their tongues? Well, they're lying against you. They're slandering you. They're speaking evil of you. Some people may be cursing you. So um, sometimes their uh, weapons, um, and it says here in verse 4, keep me from their purpose to overthrow my going. So it's not always just words. Sometimes they use circumstances and situations to try to inhibit God's will for your life. Sometimes maybe you're going through a tough time and they try to make it tougher. Sometimes they know something that could uh, prevent more harm for you. They actually want you to do it or they want things to happen in a way they can subvert situations to make things harder for you because that is who the enemy is. He wants to attack you and to, to basically throw you off the journey that God has prepared for your life. So in um, the next verse, um, verse 5, notice David calls them the proud. The proud have hit a snare for me and cords. They have spread a net by the wayside. They have set gins for me. So it's important to note that he uses the word proud to identify them. And this is a common theme that you see not only in the New Testament, but also the Old Testament. The idea of pride. In fact, I believe it was Jesus who said that pride is actually the worst sin. So why is it the worst sin? I mean, considering all the other worst things you can do. You can even kill somebody. You can... You know, whether it's a sexual sin or whether it's lying or stealing. In the end, every sin, you can trace its roots back to pride in some way or another. So uh, even Jesus said that the worst sin is pride. So this is an ongoing theme throughout the Bible. And one thing that the church has stopped preaching, uh, it feels like maybe it's just me, but we don't preach enough against pride. It seems like we're so focused on other sins that we forget that pride is a serious sin that not only causes our own lives to fall short, but also it causes us to look at other people and want worse for them. Because why do we want worse for somebody else? Uh, because what? Because in the end, we are too proud and we're not happy with where we're at to want to affect somebody else. So we're supposed to basically withdraw pride from our lives because in the end it is the root of all sin and God even considers it the worst sin. So, and one of the things you have to realize, you know, the world, when they look at us, it seems like they're most influenced by Jesus, not because he was the son of God necessarily or because he was perfect or even miracles. They're really interested in this idea of Jesus as someone who worked with the poor and hung out with the prostitutes and the sinners and the tax collectors. That, when, they, when you talk to people who are not Christian, that seems to be the most influential thing about Jesus that really seems to affect the most. You know, even I think Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi said that, you know, he loves the idea or the character of Jesus, but it's just the Christians he doesn't like because the Christians don't really embody Jesus. And I, and I believe because he was sort of that uh, humanistic kind of man who wanted to help the common man and help people, and help the poor, he was really attracted to that idea of Jesus as a person who was not proud, even though he was the son of God, but rather he worked with the poor and the low uh, 
uh, low-caste, downtrodden people of his day. So, you know, there's nothing wrong with being proud of ourselves or proud of our accomplishments or pride of, proud of our family, you know, in the sense of, you know, we work hard and we try to do the best. But when pride becomes a sin is when, does your pride make you want to create mischief in someone else's life, like David says, or use your tongue to slander about them or to lie about them? Then you are the evil that David is talking about in these verses. So, in the end, we have to realize, you know, we're not supposed to have pride, but those who come against us also have too much pride. That's why they are acting the way, or thinking, or speaking the way they are speaking. So let's look at verses 6 and 7. I said unto the Lord, Thou art my God. Hear the voice of my supplications, O Lord. O God, the Lord, the strength of my salvation, thou hast covered my head in the day of battle. So it's important to understand that God is the one who defends us from the violent and proud. So David identifies God as his strength and protection, and he uses the metaphor of a helmet. If you look at that verse, verse 7, you have covered my head in the day of battle. So just as a helmet covers your head uh, in a battle, or at least in the old days, you know, when they had swords and you know, even today, they wear hard hats, I think. Um, but, you know, the, God is like that helmet that covers our head as a protection against the proud and the evil who come against us. And um, what you have to realize, like, even sometimes God uses the weapons that people attack you to get them back. If you look at verse 9, As for the head of those that compass me about... Let the mischief of their own lips cover them. So he's basically kind of talking about the idea of karma. You know, what goes around, comes around. Sometimes there's a special satisfaction when you see that someone who has been attacking you or attacking others, they sort of get caught up in their own tricks that they've been using against other people. and they, They're getting sort of a taste of their medicine. And right there, that is what David is sort of referring to, that idea that, that their own lips sort of turn against them. And that is the, the beginning of their downfall. So, um, you know, it, it's also important to realize that, you know, David's desire uh, is not just for God to protect him, but also that righteousness be established back on this earth. If you look at verses 10 and 11. Let burning coals fall upon them. Let them be cast into the fire, into deep pits, that they rise not up again. And let not an evil speaker be established in the earth. Evil shall hunt the violent man to overthrow him. So here David is not just talking about the uh, violent attacking him, but he's talking about in general, we don't want evil people or evil speakers to be established on this earth. You know, sometimes as Christians, we get involved in our own problems, our own situations, our own lives so much that we forget that God's plan is not just for us by itself. It's also to establish righteousness back in this earth. So we know that God will eventually establish righteousness back in this earth in the end. But, you know, it, it should be our deep heart's desire to see righteousness established upon this earth. You know, God says that he loves the man, um, the heart of a man who wants good in this world. So, you know, verse 12 mentions, I know that the Lord will maintain the cause of the afflicted and the right of the poor. So, you know, let us always get, not get caught up just in our problems. We've we got to remember that there's suffering going on in the world. And God, uh, the enemy is not just attacking us, it's attacking humanity, basically. And only God can restore us. Only through the blood of Jesus Christ can we all be restored. But in the end, God will restore ultimate righteousness upon the earth. So, you know, he's called us not only to care for ourselves, but also for the whole world. You know, we need to think about the poor, the sick. The weak, the, ser uh, the, the suffering. Remember Jesus, that's one of his main themes throughout the New Testament and the Gospels. Uh, one of the most important messages of Jesus was actually the Sermon on the Mount. What did he say? He said, blessed are the meek, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the brokenhearted. And so this is a continuous theme that we see throughout the New Testament. But sometimes people forget it's actually a theme that you see in the Old Testament as well. And you see here in these last few verses... In this psalm that uh, David is really referring to them many times and trying to get us to pay attention to them and also to uh, want the best and righteousness to be established to all people. So I'm going to conclude with verse 13. 
Surely the righteous shall give thanks unto thy name. The upright shall dwell in thy presence. So that's why what I was talking about at the beginning. That I want to tie back all up to thankfulness. Um, you know, he's implying, David is implying, that you can identify the righteous by listening for whether they give thanks to God or not. It says here, the righteous shall give thanks unto thy name. That's how you identify them. So are you a person who's always complaining about the things you don't have, grumbling about what you can't get? Um, or are you a person who's giving thanks to God for what he has given to us? Are you brimming with that positivity that uh, really emanates to the world and people see that light? People notice a cheerful Christian. I've talked to many unsaved people who are like, you know, whether it's you or somebody else, man, those Christians, they really have this light about their lives. And I hear it less than I used to hear because I feel like Christians, we become like a separate group that's just about other things. But we have to remember that we're supposed to have that light that emanates through us, that God, that people see and are attracted to God and righteousness. Bob. So let's make an effort to be more thankful, to understand that God will deliver us and sustain us from those who want bad for us and that we should also look for God to not only protect us but for him to also set up righteousness on the earth not just in the eternal but even in the present we should look for goodness to happen in the world and around us thank you and God bless